Final inductee in the class of 2014 is again someone we mentioned earlier, and you've seen many of his family members up here already. Jim Martinez was a two-time world Olympic medalist. He was a bronze medalist at the 84 Olympics in Los Angeles and in the 1985 World Championships, both at 149 and a half pounds. Martinez made Greco World Teams in 1983, 86, and 1987, and wrestled collegiately for that school just across the river at the University of Minnesota, where he was a two-time All-American in 1979 and 1982, and a Big Ten champion in 1979. Heard from his brother earlier now, we'd like you to introduce our final inductee for the class of 2014, Mr. Jim Martinez. take this moment to remember this vision forever. <clears throat> well, I'd like to thank the Hall of Fame, Ellen Gloria Rice, Hall of Champions for this award. Um, it's incredibly humbling and I'm honored to be here to accept it. I want to congratulate the other inductees. Um, truly to be considered in their class is, is an honor for me uh, to be included in that fraternity and I believe that word is used so darn often in, in Greco-Roman. I'm not, I don't know much about freestyle because I've never really been associated with the freestyle aspect of it, but in Greco it's always been a fraternity. Once you joined this fraternity, you never left. You were always a part of it and it became an extension of the family that you had and one that you'd never forget. Um, I, I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, I don't know that I have enough time to truly thank everyone that has helped me attain the level of success that I had, that had a hand in guiding the decisions in my life, um, but I'd like to take a little bit of time to, to thank those that were so involved. Uh, but first I'd like, to, I'd like to start by saying what many people have said about this sport. This is truly the greatest sport that I could have ever been a part of. Uh, this sport does not discriminate. You're not going to be eliminated because of size or color or attitude. You determine how well you're going to do yourself. Uh, this sport also provides some of the greatest inspirations and success stories that we've ever seen in the history of any sport. You take a look at the success of Jeff Blatnick overcoming cancer and winning a gold medal. Uh, Roland Gardner beating Alexander Karel and beating the unbeatable Russian in order to win a gold medal. And even just recently, Anthony Robles overcame a physical deformity, being born without a leg to win an NCAA title. Those are beyond life-changing. They're experiences that inspire anyone in any sport. And I think that wrestling has only begun to start recognizing even more of our athletes as they reach continue to have success in this sport. I ask that because we've had been challenged with the elimination of wrestling, that you continue to do whatever you can to make this sport survive. I know that there are so many future athletes that will benefit from this, not only just wrestling, but it changes lives. It changed my lives. It's changed so many lives in the past. And I hope that you will do your best to help keep this wrestling that is so near and dear to our hearts alive and living strong on into the future. <clears throat> I wish I could stand up here and tell you that it was my lifetime dream to win an Olympic medal. But the fact of the matter is, I wrestled because it made me feel better. Unlike most of my peers and uh, even today's wrestlers that are training to get their shot at a world or Olympic medal, um, I, I had no idea how big our dreams could possibly become. Um, it wasn't until my first national championship that I truly had a perspective of the potential. Um, in my first national tournament, I ended up placing second, but in doing so, I beat the 1980 Olympian. And it was that moment that I realized that you might have a shot, you, you might have a chance, 
And at that point, you redefine your goals, you redesign your training plan, and then you just go for it. <clears throat> as far as my introduction into the sport, um, I guess it kind of illustrates how people can affect your lives um, and how many people positively impacted my life. To go back to the very beginning um, of my athletic career, uh, it's almost embarrassing. But I remember having a conversation with my mom uh, when I was young, and uh, it wasn't necessarily a positive conversation. I was inside, I was watching TV, and my brothers and sisters were outside playing. It was the summer, I don't know, I might have been seven, eight years old. <clears throat> well, when you grow up in a family like Martinez's, I had two sisters that were named the outstanding female athletes at Osseo High School. I had a two-time state champion younger brother. My younger brothers had won more state championships than I ever had. So I was not necessarily the best or most outstanding athlete in this family. Um, so when your brothers and sisters are picked before you in sport games and you're the last one picked, and really when you're the last one, they basically say, well, you can have Jim. No, you have Jim. No, you have Jim. So I'm in the house watching TV, and my mom says, you're not going to stay in here and be a cream puff, so get your butt out there and play with your brothers and sisters. So that was my first challenge to get up, get moving. Uh, it was not necessarily a pep talk, but um, it, she wouldn't allow me to do anything other than get out there and try. And I, I thank my mom for that motivation, uh, if that's what we want to call it. Um, <laughs> but but it, it didn't allow me to just sit there and be a, a cream puff. Um, but my mom was actually the one that made the decision that I was going to wrestle. I, like many others, as we were growing up, we really didn't have any uh, wrestling heroes at that time because it was before the 72 games, and that's truly when Dan Gable brought us that inspirational story. And so when I had the opportunity to join wrestling uh, or, or start a winter sport, I wanted to play basketball. I mean, everybody was playing basketball. And, and that's really the way I kind of lived my life. Well, everybody's doing that, and I'm going to play basketball. Well, she wouldn't let me play basketball. She said, well, Somewhere along the line, one of the coaches is going to say, you're not tall enough. You're, you're, you know, you're not going to be able to shoot over people. So you should maybe try gymnastics or, or wrestling. Well, I didn't know gymnastics. I didn't know anything about gymnastics. And I thought wrestling was like we see. It was the claw. It was, you know, Vern Gagne. It was, it was uh, the crusher and bruiser. So I didn't really want to be a part of that. But after talking, I was convinced that it wasn't that bad of a deal, and I ended up going up for wrestling, and I, I kind of enjoyed it. It was fun. It was hard work, but I made a lot of friends, and I had a lot of success. And I think that in anything that we do, this, as soon as you start receiving some level of success, you begin to find more enjoyment out of it, you begin to work a little bit harder, and once you start working a little bit harder, you enjoy more success, and it's really cyclical. cyclical. You, you want to spend more time doing it. You want to get better. Well, after that first year, uh, come the next year rolling around, Osseo didn't have a 98 pounder. They didn't have anybody light enough. So my high school wrestling coaches, Jim Chester and Woody Ferry, came to see my parents and talked them into letting me wrestle. I only weighed about 88 pounds, but that was as close as we could get to 98 pounds. And I know my mom didn't want me to wrestle. She didn't want me to wrestle at eighth grade. She I was going to get hurt. You know, she's very protective. Uh, but my dad obviously wanted to give me a shot because he was very proud. He was my eighth grade boy going to be able to wrestle varsity. Um, they were very convincing. My dad won the argument, and, I, and that started. Uh, I, it, it kind of opened the door to make me realize that I was going to be competitive, whatever level that I got to. I didn't win all my matches. I think I had an eight-eight record, but but I won eight matches, and eight matches at that level where these kids were, you know, they were a year older. I mean, some were ninth graders, tenth graders, eleventh graders, twelfth graders, and and it was embarrassing to take some of those losses, but it didn't discourage me, and I keep kept coming back, kept coming back, kept coming back. Um, my career at that point, because I got that early experience, helped me believe even more in myself. I continued to wrestle and, uh, and, and continue, kept experiencing success. The one thing that I hated about wrestling was cutting weight. It was the most difficult thing for me to do. And it, it wasn't that I didn't know how, it was more than I probably didn't want to. Um, that refrigerator was my friend and I didn't want to stay away from it. Um, my coach, Woody Ferry, was one of the first coaches to really understand me. 
And uh, he was kind enough to let me stay at his house prior to the state championships. And, and really, the only thing that it did was it kept me away from the refrigerator. He knew that if I was staying down in his basement, I was not going to come upstairs and get in his refrigerator at night. And he was a very smart man. Um, had me in locks in the refrigerator at home, I probably could have made it a lot easier. But when you've got uh, eight kids in your family, uh, yeah, refrigerators open all night. And that was my biggest concern. So um, that, but by helping me manage my weight, by helping me make that discipline, that decision to not eat by being in his house, it really did enable me to, to win a state championship. And, and again, those little footsteps or those steps that it would take make you believe even more and more in yourself. I was lucky enough to go to the University of Minnesota and I'm so grateful that Wally Johnson considered me uh, athletic enough and, and enough of a find that we would, he would allow me to go to school there. My coaches, Wally Johnson, Larry Zilberberg, Mike MacArthur, Tom Press, and Joe Corso, instrumental in giving me the perspective from size, from speed, from just teaching me to, to experiment and learn as a wrestler because you, coaches will only show you so much. And the rest is something that you have to find out yourself. Your move is going to be your move because you make it your move. It's not because some coach told you to do it one way. It's a sport that only you can make your own. And uh, Wally was an interesting man. <clears throat> For those of us that wrestled with Wally, and I'm really grateful to see many of my, my teammates here, um, Wally gave you a little bit of positive and a lot of negative reinforcement. <laughs> and he, he's the kind of man that would do anything for the sport. And, and Wally is a, uh, a distinguished member of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. A man uh, years ahead of his time with the thought about where wrestling should go and um, getting the Federation to take over for the AAU. Um, but Wally also had a vocabulary that I think that we would only term salty. We, we didn't want our parents here at MTOC, and if you ever watched Wally coach, he coached like this. And you would never read his lips because of what he was yelling at you. <laughs> but you always heard him from the side of the mat. Um, but I'm grateful for what, what Wally and, and all my coaches have, have given me. Um, but more importantly, my teammates and my roommates here at the Minnesota, at the University of Minnesota, they became my friends for life. They were extension of my family. Um, they, we did everything together, we struggled together, we succeeded together, we found ways to, to get through school and uh, both wrestling and our lives were changed forever as a result of the friendships that we gave and I was talk, I've seen so many of them today. 37 years ago I started these friendships and they're some of the best friendships I've ever had in my life. I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, there was a couple of friends that convinced me to go to my first world team training camp back in 1979. And George Bowman, Brad Huckle, Gene Shaw, we talked about going out to the national team, and it was more, or the national team camp, and it was more George than anything convinced us, yeah, we're gonna go out there, we're gonna go to a world team camp, and we're gonna have a great experience. So sure enough, we talked our parents into it, we get in the car, we head out for Squaw Valley, California. Drive all day, drive all night, we get in there, it's dark, you know, camp's done for the day, and. George drives up and we're waiting in the car and George walks up and the camp director walks out and we hear them having a conversation and um, ends up coming back to the car and we think, okay, where do we stay? Where are we going to go? He says, we said, what did he say? He said, well, he said, go home. He said, we don't have any room for you. I don't know who you are. Nobody told us you were coming. I don't know you from Adam. You go home. Well, we drove all the way out to California. We're going to turn around and go back. So George makes a call to Wally, and Wally calls up Dan Gable, and sure enough, we find a way to get into the camp. We find our own room. We, we don't we take care of ourselves. I don't know how many sandwiches we ate during that two-week period, but um, we end up staying out there and got our first taste of getting our butts kicked by the best wrestlers in the world. And it, was, it, was, it was a truly great experience. Um, and, and one of those things where every time you touch greatness, it only inspired you more. Dan Gable was there, and Lee Kemp was there, and Randy Lewis, and you know, all these guys that were world champions or potential world champions and Olympic champions. That was our first taste of being associated with somebody on that level. It wasn't just Minnesota, but now we're talking about the best in the world. And again, another level of motivation that inspires you to go out and just keep going, keep going. 
But October 20, or excuse me, October 6, 1981, changed my life. I just started working out for my senior year at the University of Minnesota, and wasn't prepared for camp to start. Wasn't prepared for the season to begin. After practice, got a call. My brother had slipped in a gymnastics gymnastics accident, broke his neck, paralyzed. It was that moment that I realized there was a sense of urgency to do whatever I could. My brother's opportunity, and my brother was a very wrestler, but by the time he was 16 years old, he had won multiple schoolboy national championships in freestyle and rock and roll wrestling. And at that moment, he would no longer wrestle again. In fact, he no longer walk again. And when I realized that this was something that was never going to be guaranteed for the rest of my life, in fact, there are no guarantees in anybody's life, it motivated me to commit my life to doing whatever I could. It didn't matter how tough or tired I was. It didn't matter how, uh, how challenged I was about being practiced. I was going to do whatever it took to be better, to be able to commit myself to working harder, to achieving something that was beyond what I knew I could make, but something that I had an actual desire and dream to make. It was the way that my brother handled this adversity, never giving up his therapy, you know, committing himself to, I'm going to walk. I mean, that was the only thing that he ever said. Well, I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this thing. But. We knew that it probably wouldn't happen. <clears throat> but because of that, that experience, because of that tragic event, I was more motivated than I'd ever been in my life. And it's sad, but sometimes in the very worst moments of our life, it turns into a positive result. And by having that motivation, I had the best senior year that I possibly could have had. And it, it made me realize that there was more ahead. Well, after I finished my eligibility at the University of Minnesota, I was kind of like, well, you know, what next? I, I really wasn't as accomplished as a freestyle wrestler as I had hoped to be. I didn't really think that I, I had another direction to go. And then in steps Dan Chandler and Brad Ryans and Alan Rice and inviting me to wrestle Greco Roman. And I am really, really grateful that they didn't take no for an answer. And they did. Kicking and screaming, they pulled me into practice and, and made me wrestle. But Initially, I thought the only reason that they wanted me in the program was that the bill dummy was getting worn out and they needed another throwing body so that they could practice on it. Because truly, this was the best Greco team in the country. And they, it, to be on the mat with guys like Jim Andre and John Hughes and Gary Pelsel, Pat Marcy, um, Gary Alexander, Dan Chandler, Todd Grass, I mean, these guys would literally kick my butt Every single day, every single day, it was embarrassing to go in there and get thrown around as bad as I did. But I was honored to be a part of the club. I was glad that they let me be a part of the club. And had it not been for their never say die attitude, never take no for an answer, I would have never had the success that I, success that I had. I, I know that when I hear the kids that I recruit to Russell Greco, said, oh, I don't know Greco, I don't understand Greco, it's, you know, you're going to get thrown and I don't like to be thrown. Those are the very same excuses I was using to avoid wrestling Greco, and I hear them today and I laugh when I hear them, but i taken that, that attitude is that you don't say no. But here's the amazing thing about the, the Minnesota Wrestling Club, is that not only did they beat you up, but at the end of the day, they showed you exactly what they used to beat you up with. Because they didn't feel that if you're going to wrestle Grupper, you're going to be a good partner for them if they didn't teach you how to defend the tactics that were so successful. And so every day they would beat me up at the end of the day, well, here's how you get out of a body lock. Here's how you get out of an arm throw. Here's how you get out of a headlock. And I think that they probably at the time didn't realize that he was a threat. They were going to give this to me because they would help me get better so they could help them get better. Um, but I think that they also know that I had potential. And I believe that their selflessness, seeing that here was another talented individual brought into their club, um, 
there might be some danger that he could be competitive. And I am grateful that maybe they looked past that and said, well, we're just going to give it to him and see where he goes with it. And some of them were my teammates. They became my competitors. But they made me a better Greco wrestler in spite of how the outcome may have been for their wrestling career. And I am so very grateful that they gave me all the tools necessary to compete at that next level. Um, <clears throat> some of the guys that and inspired me, not only technically, but my roommate for a year was uh, Mike Farina. He, in 1976, as a high school senior, he was on the, the 76 Olympic team. And I've never seen a man more intense about training. In fact, I thought he was psychotic. This was Dan Gable kind of crazy about wrestling. You know, he would lift weights for four hours at a time, and it was, it was insane. But when we sat down, we talked about how much you need to be more motivated than somebody else. You had to be more intense than somebody else. You, you couldn't allow yourself to have a weakness. You had to be willing to commit more than anybody else to succeed. And I'm grateful for that, those kinds of people that, that shared that kind of insight. Um, Dennis Kozlowski, who became a great friend of mine, we had a very disastrous first meeting at the NCAAs, and uh, we can talk about that more later, guys. but uh, we became one of the best friends. But as we were both being kind of indoctrinated in the Minnesota Wrestling Club, we were not yet there, but we traveled a lot together. And we drove out to Colorado Springs together, we drove out to Nationals together. And there were times, I remember hours that we would talk and there would never be a silence in the, in the car during those entire trips. And sometimes it feels like we're just blowing smoke up our, our butts, you know, you're, God, you're so great, I think that, you know, you do this and we're going to be there. And, you know. and, and yet, I, I think half of our sport is you fake it until you make it. You know, you may not be there yet, but you better start believing in yourself. And if not today, then when? And, and so we continually were finding ways to motivate ourselves or encourage one another. Or, you know, we, even if we had to make it up, I think we, we found ways to support one another. And it was a great learning experience because in our minds it, it taught us how we had to create that seed of belief in ourselves. Because no one was going to give it to us. Our competitors weren't going to give it to us. When we stepped on the mat, we were by ourselves. And so if we didn't create that belief in ourselves that we could stand across the mat against anybody, it was never going to happen. And, and those are the things that, I, again, if I didn't live those experiences, I, I would never have been able to be able to stand here with you tonight. And, and I'm, again, grateful for the friendships, great, great, grateful for those lessons that I learned along the way. Um, I know iron sharpens iron. I, I heard that continually. But I hated, absolutely hated, competing against Andy Saris. Andy Saris was one of my... One of my competitors, I wrestled more times than anybody I wrestled in my entire career. And our matches would be 1-0, 2-0, 2-1, 3-2, 3-1. 3-1. Those kinds of matches, they are the grinding matches that make you understand that you have to wrestle six minutes out of six minute matches. If you let up a second, you're going to get taken down. If you didn't try during the entire thing, he was going to attack you and he was going to caution you and put you down and you didn't want to be put down because they're so good at lifts and they're good at turns. And I, I truly would... I, I, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't acknowledge the fact that my competitors made me the kind of person that could believe I could step out of the mat against anybody in the world and compete. So as much as Andy was my enemy at the time, he became a great friend and he was my motivation to be better. And, and I'm truly grateful that, that I had Andy, uh, Andy challenging me. But even before I had the chance to compete at the world level, I had people that were involved in my life that made it financially viable for me to be able to compete. Because we, I didn't have a lot of money. I, I didn't come from a wealthy background. Um, but it was guys like Pat Marcy and Tom Press, who I owe my life to. Pat Marcy, gave me a job working for his company, and I was probably a terrible employee because when I worked for him, I did the work that I needed to do, but there were times when I was in the back lifting weights and lifting shingles and lifting roll roofing like Dan showed you the log, and so I probably wasn't spending as much time doing the work I was getting paid for, but had I not been doing the other work, I would never have had 
the lift, the gut wrench, all the things that I needed to be a successful wrestler. And I'm so grateful you put up with me for that year to allow me to work and, and be able to financially make it for a year. Um, and, and then Tom Press, he was instrumental in giving me a job working for Jay Dyer, Dyco Petroleum. And that was kind of a precursor to the U.S. Olympic uh, Opportunity Program, where part of the time when I was gone, they were actually giving me a little bit of a, a stipend so that I could be able to pay my rent and pay my car payment and, and do those kinds of things. And, and Tom was just a huge influence on my life. He was like the big brother that I never had. He was, he was a mentor. He was a role model. Uh, encouraged me. I, I am so grateful, Tom, for what you've given me in my life. I, I can never thank you enough. Um, and it, it's those people that, again, make this transition or this journey through my wrestling career a, a viable option for me to continue. Um, as far as my wrestling, my Greco coaches, and every year we know that you get a different national team or world team coach, and uh, it, it's they don't spend a lot of time with you, but in the time that they have you, they try to share as much information as, as they can. And I'm glad I got a, talk, talk, a chance to talk to you, Wayne, before um, for tonight, because I think Wayne provided some of the, Wayne Bachman was one of the toughest men that I've ever met in my entire life and he was my 1982 uh, World Team Camp coach. But we had a three-way competition for the 1982 World Team and Johnny Selman and Tom Mickle and I were wrestling and I beat Johnny Selman and Tom beat, beat I beat Johnny, Tom got beat by Johnny and Tom beat me. So it was a three-way tie. And in the end result was that Johnny Solomon was selected to be on the 82 World Team, even though there wasn't was a clear favorite. And at that time, it was a devastating blow because I thought I had earned the, team, the spot on the team. So, so Wayne, you provided more inspiration than you could possibly imagine because taking away that opportunity only inspired me more to work hard and, and get on that next team. So even though it wasn't your choice, I, 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 I truly thank you for that opportunity and motivation that you provided. Uh, the other coach that was absolutely a life changer for me was Pavel Kotsin. And Pavel Kotsin was a Russian that came on board that I first met in 1983. Um, uh, he was one of the hardest coaches that I ever had, but he was one of the most technical mo coaches that I ever had. And I think that he may not have been the best coach, but he was a Russian. And I wanted to believe that the Russian, he came from Russia, he had to be the best coach in the world. You know, he's given me the Russian technique, and that was the secret to my success. It may not have been the case, but I believed it. And you know what, all you need is that belief in order to take it to the next level. So I was grateful for what he said. And, and part of Pavel's message, message to me was he said, he said, Jimmy, and he always called me Jimmy. You know, everybody's called me Jimmy. And he said, Jimmy, you, you did a great job, but Jimmy, you will not win your medal unless you listen to your coach. And, and it really was true because we get in these camps and we're in a four-week camp and we're working out four times a day and you're exhausted, you're sore, you're beat up, you're tired, you just want to go home. And that's as long as I've probably been away from home. So he's telling me that all you have to do is do what I tell you. He said, if you do what I tell you, I'll get you your medal. If you do the same way that you're working on it, I know you won't get your medal, and then you're going to blame any. No, ever, you're not going to blame anybody but yourself. He said, "But if you do what I tell you, you blame. And you don't get your medal, you blame me. But I guarantee you, you'll get your medal." He said, "I don't know what color it's going to be. You get your medal." So in that in that conversation, I learned how to put my trust in a coach and believe in him. And I think, as young wrestlers, it's hard to convince them that. That's the kind of trust that they have to place in their coach. Their coach is never going to tell them something bad. Their coach is going to do things that are going to make them better. And yes, getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning. Yes, doing lifting after wrestling. Doing all the hard things that make champions champions. Those are the things that we have to share with our wrestlers. They don't necessarily want to hear it, but that's our job, that's our task that we got to share with them. And then finally, in 1984, even though Dan Chandler was a teammate at that time, I don't know if he realizes how instrumental he was in preparing me mentally. He would pull us aside and say, well, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go into these, these hallways and you're going to have these rooms off the side and you're going to get ready. And then you walk up, there's going to be these big mats and there's going to be television screens. And it was kind of like he did all the groundwork to prepare me mentally so that I wasn't going to walk out there and I was going to be 
you know, the, the deer in the headlights type event. Type and, and we can. I mean, because it's a huge, uh, a huge event. I mean, the colors, the TV, the fans. And being in the United States, it was, it was the biggest and, and most enjoyable experience of my life. But, but Dan, you prepared me more than I realized, and I'm not sure if you realized how much you helped me, and I'm, I'm truly grateful for the insight that you shared with me to prepare me for that time. <clears throat> that gave me an, an incredible amount of success, and my success in wrestling is something that I will cherish for the remainder of my life. Now, as for my family, I have to go back there because my family is everything. They're my greatest support, and yet they keep me humble every step of the way. Um, my parents had no great wealth. Um, they had regular jobs. They were fairly unremarkable. Um, and they really didn't have the means to give us much more than food, shelter, clothing. But what they did give us is their time, their support, and their love. We weren't pushed to win. The message was always, just do your best. We're proud of you because you did all you could. The greatest moments in my career were beyond any dreams I ever had as a child. As a child. But the reason they became extraordinary is because my entire family was there to be a part of it. <clears throat> now the last chapter of my life is being written, and I wouldn't be standing here if it hadn't been for my wife and my family that made my life complete. She encouraged me to get back into coaching so that I could give to others the way that they helped me. She's given my life more meaning, and I'm grateful that Pam and Jess and Stephen could be here to share this part of my life. The, rest, the recognition that you've given me is such an unbelievable honor, but it's really a celebration of the many people that touched my life. I was shaped by those who came into my life, helped guide my decisions, and put me in a position to have a chance to succeed. Everyone who coached me, mentored me, hired me, was a roommate, a teammate, made a donation, bought a t-shirt, or cheered for me. I thank you for being a part of this incredible journey. For those of you who have taken the time tonight to be a part of this event, I hope you recognize that it's not been what you've given me. If it had not been what you've given me, I wouldn't be here. This has been truly a team effort. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a part of my life and my success. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause for class of 2014 inductee, Mr. June Martinez.